Hello, Mark. How are you? I'm good. Everything all right? Everything's good. All good in the hood, man. How are you doing? Um, well, now that's a beautiful background. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, yeah, well, I'll tell you, uh, because uh, I had virtually no life as a teenager, um, I know within a nanosecond exactly what film that comes from. Now, you should probably tell the audience for our first ever uplink why you've chosen that one. So this is Space Station 5 um, from 2001 A Space Odyssey. And uh, this is en route to the moon near the beginning of the film. So if you're listening, Libby Jackson, you need to stop listening now because we know you haven't seen it, but uh, one of the few members of humankind in the space industry that haven't seen 2001. Uh, but anyway, so um, there's a character called Dr. Haywood Floyd, um, who is a senior advisor to a, um, an American space agency. It's not NASA, but it's obviously NASA. Um, and he's on the way to the moon to investigate uh, mysterious signals which have emitted from the moon. And at this phase, though, he's, he's under a cover story. He's telling um, Soviet colleagues, um, space scientists coming back from the moon through Space Station 5, uh, he's telling them that uh, there's a pandemic or a, a, a plague on the moon and, and uh, how timely could that be? Um, and uh, so he's uh, ch chatting in this particular location here in one of these uh, chairs. And the, the phrase comes out um, that the, the Soviet guy is pretty distrustful. He's saying, you know, you're an astronomer. Um, why are you going to the moon to investigate an epidemic? And Haywood Floyd replies with this wonderful phrase. It's actually in the book, not in the film. But um, and the phrase is something along the lines of, you know, it, it's years since I've been a real, since I've done any real research. You know, I used to be an astronomer, but now I'm a scientific advisor. I know absolutely nothing about absolutely everything, which is pretty much my job. So, um, you know, I associate with this scene very strongly and with Haywood Floyd. Uh, and it also looks like I'm sitting in one of those chairs, which is cool. Indeed, it's, it's one of the coolest chairs of all time. And of course, I mean, this is pretty momentous, Mark, because it's not just um, that work that you do, but also as, uh, I guess, our uh, co-founder at Space Rocks. Um, you know, uh, this is a pretty momentous uh, development for us all, a, a decision to, uh, to reach people while they're at home. Yep. No, no, I mean, we've, you know, I've been four and a half weeks here. I've been in my, in my shed, which is behind this virtual background and uh, not going out very much at all. And I've got lots of work. I've been in telecons today and yesterday, and there's lots of stuff going on, but it, it, you kind of missed the human contact. And you and I have done a couple of video chats and, and other things, uh, catching up on social stuff and on work and, uh, you know, bringing familiar faces and voices into somebody's home. It, it really makes a difference. Uh, and also, the other thing is that we can bring in some very interesting people who've got lots of interesting things to say about what's going on in the world of space and science, but also, as we have this evening, uh, somebody to talk about some of the issues we're all facing as we're stuck at home. Indeed. Well, uh, you know, I guess like you um, here in London, uh, I too have been self-isolating um, for the last few weeks. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it is certainly a, a moment where uh, we can't just benefit from uh, I guess the you know the distractions and so on, but you know some some real hard science as well, you know, because a huge amount of research, of course, has been done in the area of isolation, you know. So um, I, I I guess uh, we should probably bring our guest of honor, you know, aboard at this point. Um, you know, she's been very patiently waiting in the uh, the waiting room here. Um, in just a moment, we're going to be joined, hopefully, by uh, Beth Healy. Okay, here she is. In a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Drum roll, please. Yeah, exactly. We've all done the Zoom thing. There she is. Very good. There she is. Hello, Beth. How are you doing? Oh, oh. Can you hear us? All right. We're going to. Uh, <laughs> we should be able to hear you now. Yeah, I can hear you. Hi, guys. All right. How are you doing? Hi. How are you? Yeah, good. Thank you. Hello. Right, that's very good. Yeah. Evening. <laughs> uh, now, I, it's amazing. I'm amazed by your Zoom background. It's amazing. It looks like you're in some I, kind of cool place in, in Switzerland somewhere or in France. I mean, you know. Cool enough to see. I didn't realize you could do that. That's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> this is my lounge. This is way less exciting than yours. <laughs> anyway, no, it's absolutely brilliant. I mean, trust me, you don't want to see my apartment. Uh, but, uh, so, 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 Beth, um, an absolute delight to have you here again. Obviously, uh, this isn't the first time that you've joined us. 
for uh, uh, Space Rocks. I mean, you were a, a, a huge part of our inaugural event in London, uh, uh, which feels like yesterday, but uh, I guess yeah. it's going two years ago. Yeah, it was awesome. I remember Mark talking about Space Rocks a couple of years before it even started as well, and it's super exciting that that it became what it's what it's become. So yeah, I'm really stoked to be um, part of this first uplink with you all. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Well, it, it, well, it's certainly a pleasure to have you here. Uh, so, so, so where are you actually uh, 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 hailing from today? Uh, where, where, where is that actual background from? Um, so I'm in Chamonix in France. Well, it's absolutely fantastic. I, mean, I, I guess, you know, um, by your standards, uh, fairly tropical climate, I imagine. Um, I mean, I guess, you know, uh, we, we all know while we're here, um, because we want to talk to you a little bit about a, a, a pretty uh, remarkable experience um, that you had, uh, uh, some tremendous research that you're doing. So I guess I should start with the most obvious question of all. What business does a space agency have in Antarctica? So the whole idea of um, Concordia, which is the base that we had in Antarctica, um, is that we were doing research looking at the effects of the isolation on the overwintering crew there. Um, because in Antarctica, um, during the winter period, um, the crew are completely inaccessible, and that's because of the low light levels. So we have about 105 days where we don't have any sunlight. And we also have um, an extreme temperatures, so we have about minus 80 degrees centigrade um, during the winter time, and that means that planes can't get to us. Um, and the reason that ESA and space agencies in general are really interested in that is because, of course, when um, astronauts leave low Earth orbit, where they currently are on the International Space Station, and look to go towards sort of longer duration missions, um, for example, going to the moon or then to Mars, then they're going to be more inaccessible than they currently are, and they're going to be experiencing isolation a lot like we had in Antarctica. And so all of the studies are really aimed at looking at the effects of the isolation on both the physiology and the psychology of the overwintering crew because from that we can learn a lot about some of the challenges that future astronauts might be facing on these missions. So, so just remind us again for the people that don't know where Concordia is specifically it's not at the South Pole and it's not on the coast but it's in a fairly special place uh, nevertheless right? Yeah, so it's one of the inland stations. So in Antarctica, most of the stations are on the coast, um, but you've got the three, so you've got Vostok, South Pole and Concordia, which are all um, sort of more or less in a similar place in Antarctica. Um, and they're definitely the most extreme in terms of temperatures and the most isolated as well. Um, and the reason they're actually all there is because of ice core drilling. So there's not actually much snowfall in the middle of Antarctica, which means that if you're coring down for ice, you don't actually have to go so deep to go along way back in time because there's not loads of snow building up layer on layer each year so that's why they were originally built in that sort of geographical location um, but it's also more interesting for ESA because it is a little bit more isolated than other stations. So, so the altitude I can't remember now is it around three and a half thousand meters or so is that about right? Yeah, that's right. And also because it's um, an Antarctic station um, in the poles, the barometric pressure, which is sort of the pressure that you have at alt altitude, is relatively a bit lower. So um, so even though the altitude, so yeah, it's about 3,300 meters, it actually feels a little bit higher. So if you were um, in the Alps, for example, here, it would be a li little bit like living on the top of Mont Blanc for the year. That's the kind of oxygen levels that we have there. Right. And, and again, just that, that business about the ice coring, I mean, we're you know, going off on the science, it's, I think you can get back there, what about 800,000 years, I think, of drilling down through those three and a half kilometers. Um, and it's this, this thing called Epica, right? The, the original ice core that was done. And that allows us to trace the CO2 content back over those 800,000 years and really see you know, how, how badly it's changed in, in the yeah. uh, Anthropocene. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing that Concordia in many ways is most proud of, because that's where those ice cores were drilled with the Epica project. And actually, when you're at Concordia, you can go and you can sort of open a little lid and you can look down the, the tunnel, which um, drilled that oldest ever ice core, which is super cool. Um, and they also have all these different ice cores just um, lying about, or the ones that they haven't used for the research. And you can choose different time periods. So if we had like parties and things, you can like chop off a bit of ice that went back to like before Christ and things to have on New Year's or something in your genetics. We didn't do, but you could have if you'd wanted to. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Right. No, no, of course you didn't do, right? You no. really didn't do. No, 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 no. Absolutely not. <laughs> of, course, 
I mean, I mean, Beth, I mean, what's remarkable about, about this experience, of course, it's not just the science that you extracted it uh, from it all, um, but also the, the experience of going there. I and mean, what goes through your mind um, when you travel somewhere that you know that you can't immediately, you know, come back from? I mean, was it was it scary? Did you have a sense of adventure? Was it pure excitement? Or did it not hit you until you actually, I guess, offloaded your luggage? Um, so it was all pretty crazy, like from the point of getting the job to actually stepping foot in Antarctica. Like for me, going to Antarctica had always been a, a big dream of mine. So flying down there and I got to sit in the cockpit as we landed onto the sea ice and seeing that for the first time was all for me really exciting. And I, I guess I didn't really have catch, time to catch breath because when I applied for the job, to be honest, I didn't really think I would get it. And so I was like, well, I'll put an application and see. And then suddenly I find that I got it and I was like, well, this is an opportunity too good for me to give up and they were like okay we'll see you in Cologne in like a week and I was like oh, all right and suddenly I had all of this training and there was actually quite a lot to do because I got the job I can't remember around June time I think um, and then it all pretty much kicked off around sort of August September and I was in Antarctica by um, November time so you know it was all sort of going to all different countries as in America and Italy all around the place um, learning um, about all the different experiments I'd be doing. Just, just, just quickly to interject, where, where were you in your career as a doctor at that point? Um, so I'd done two years. So I'd um, just finished the foundation program for any doctors that ran there. So I was just um, working at Chelsea and Westminster in London. Um, and I'd done my sort of first two sort of house officer um, years. So it's did, you, did, you, did you already have kind of extreme environments experience? I mean, where they just sort of pick you, you know, with things? <laughs> Yeah, so um, I mean, the main reason I got involved actually is because when I was a student, I went to um, Cologne at the Astronaut Center um, just for a week. They do like a human physiology course for students. Um, and I got a place on that and I went along and I was completely clueless about space, to be honest. Um, and I'd recommend it to any um, students out there because it's called like the ESA Academy and they're still running it. And it's really cool. I was having barbecues with astronauts and I never, you know, I didn't really know much about the space program at that point. And, and um, so that was really sort of my sort of open door because I thought everyone would be really geeky and all my friends were like, why are you going to do that? Oh, geeky? Thing? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> and um, no, no, I, I was pleasantly surprised. Like, I was like, I felt like I fitted in. Everyone's really friendly. And um, and that was the, the main thing that got me engaged, I guess, with ESA as an, as an idea that it was for somebody like me um, and then from that I, I always loved my skiing so I've done lots of stuff um, as part of like medical logistical support team um, doctoring um, and also on a personal level as well just my own skiing and things so I was sort of used to being in the mountains I've done a bit up in Greenland already um, and I've been on sort of North Pole Marathon as well so I've got a bit of experience but nothing um, can quite prepare you I think for Concordia. <laughs> It's a different kettle of fish when it comes to temperatures and things. Indeed. Well, I mean, uh, I, I guess, uh, you know, one of the uh, the nicknames that I think, you know, really sparks the imagination is that Antarctica is known as the White Mars, of course. And, you know, I yeah. mean, did it feel like being on another world, on another planet? Yeah, I mean, I really felt that, especially when we lost the sun. I think that was the moment where I really felt like disconnected from life back home because you know, the sun is like that familiar thing wherever you go in the sky, you know, you can go on holiday to somewhere, a different country that's different to your own, it all feels a bit wacky, and, but you, you always have that familiar feature. Um, whereas to lose that, it really did make me feel really disconnected. Um, and the landscape was very different, like with all the stars and like, you know, you'd walk out at lunchtime, you could see the Milky Way. Um, and so, so yes, I did. And, and, you know, astronauts often talk about sort of the overview effect. And when they talk about that, they're talking about going up in space and looking Looking back on Earth with that different perspective, and although unfortunately I haven't been to space, <laughs> although I'd love to, um, it's I felt that I had a similar experience um, by feeling disconnected from from my life back home, um, and sort of just getting that new perspective on on what it was I'd been up to over the last last years, and and also what it was I wanted to do with in the future. And I, I think that's also kind of an experience which I think a lot of us might be having as well during um, the isolation that we're also experiencing with COVID as well. It's like an opportunity really to kind of step back, take a bit of a breather and maybe reevaluate on things as well. And just, just picking up on that, I mean, it struck me all of a sudden there's a bit of an analogy or perhaps a bit more drawn out because of course you didn't arrive in winter, you arrived in perpetual summer uh, mm. when there's a lot more people at Concordia doing 
things which are not linked to the night time or wintering over doing ice, kill, uh, ice core drilling and so on. And yet those people, as, as the sun sets around the horizon and goes down slowly, they, mm. they drifted away. And then there's a day when you're all left alone. So it's kind of the equivalent of the day where the government says, now you're in isolation. You're kind of preparing for it because you know it's coming, but then yeah. the day it comes, there's a shift. Yeah, and I think it's interesting the way that governments have gradually done lockdown. You know, it's not like one day everything's normal, one day lockdown. Most governments have chosen to do, you know, now we're shutting schools a few days, now we're doing this and increasing the restrictions. And again, it was kind of similar um, having that gradual approach with Antarctica, because I think there's a lot of anxiety as well pre-winter time. And, and I felt quite anxious during the summer before winter, because you have all of the um, guys that come back year on year for the summer times. And, you know, and they're really <laughs> happy to like tell you about all the horror stories and things that go down in Concordia. And they're like, what are you doing? Like, you should get out. Well, you still can and you're like oh my god <laughs> like, what am I doing and like you know even the even the pilot he was like come on the plane like for the last plane and I was just like you know you're like ready to just jump on and leave it but and it was actually a bit of a relief when that last plane went you know you sort of had all the planning and all the preparation and all the mental anxiety about whether or not it was the right decision to be spending nine months um down there and actually there was just this sort of moment of calm um and then I started to get anxious going, I was like, oh my God, it's actually gone, you know, it's happening. But it was almost, um, yeah, a little bit calming to be like, okay, I'm in this, like I've made this decision. And actually all those sort of self doubts and, and thoughts about whether or not I should do it kind of left me a little bit. And the idea of going home and, and worries about whether I should be doing it sort of departed. And that was kind of kind of cool in a way, just to be able how, to make that right. How many, people, how many people were in the winter over crew and how many, out of that crew that winter had had been there before so they're kind of in, experience yeah. inexperience mismatch yeah so um we were a crew of 13 and actually two of our crew had already overwintered and overwintered at um concordia specifically so which i thought was quite interesting because i thought most people that would do repeat over winters would maybe change the station um but but yeah so they had both chosen concordia and i think it's maybe a dangerous thing to do because both of them had had like really positive experiences with their first overwinter and you know it's always you're making that comparison between what you've done before and what this one was and and i think it's you know the second time it's never quite as exciting for some people but but they did really well and it was really valuable for our crew as well to have that experience and like they sort of were able to offer advice about things that they had done um, which had been useful with them. So with the, 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 the kind of George Clooney to Sandra Bullock in Gravity right you know the, gris <laughs> the grizzled old person who's been there and done it many times and then you come along and it's like I'm here for the first time tell me what to do but so I'm curious about whether did they help in the sense they helped you settle or was it important that you found your own pace, your own way of dealing with day to day and not have people tell you? Because we, you know, lots of people are doing that. You know, here's the advice for isolation. Here's the advice for what you should do. You need a routine. And people are different, right? Everybody has to find their own way. The flip side is of course you're there to work and that's something different to what a lot of people are just stuck at home. Not kind of, yeah. not, not a lot to do maybe. No, it's true. I, I think in some respects, it's really useful to have the training because, you know, lots of people ask, you know, is there somebody that's really good at isolating? And I think the, the honest answer to that is like, I don't think anyone's a complete natural, you know, I think there's all things that all of us can learn to help um, improve uh, uh, us both working in a team in isolation but also our own sort of mental well-being and um, so I think there are strategies um, that we can all learn and put in place but I don't think that we'll find all of them useful as you say like some people find something useful whereas other people don't and I think it's about learning about yourself um, how you react to different situations and how, what you might find useful so I think it's really important to listen to all of the advice but don't feel obliged that you have to do all of it just try and find out what works for you um, and I also think, you know, it's to be kind on yourself as well. You know, I think people have really high expectations of what they want to do and all this sort of spare time and, and having this time at home or, or, you know, they want to do a hundred online learning projects and they want to be sort of have a six pack and they want to be, you know, a yoga teacher by the end of it and all these um, high expectations on themselves. And I think you have to understand that also in isolation, like science does show that we are a little bit more fatigued, we are a bit less effective and we have that sort of sensory deprivation as well. Um, and so we, we need to sort of listen to that a little bit as well and give ourselves a, 
you know, give ourselves a little bit of a break as well. And while I think it's important to try and have these goals and these routines, I think, you know, if, if one night you want to sit down and watch Downton Abbey on TV, then that's cool as well. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean did, did, did you find that was true of yourself while you were there, Beth? I mean, uh, uh, obviously, uh, uh, there's so much to learn from an experience like yours. Um, but uh, in retrospect, uh, looking back on your time there, did you find that you were going through many of the telltale signs of what happens during isolation? Um, I think I definitely became like a bit less effective at times. I remember it taking me like all morning to write an email once and like I got a bit forgetful, which is quite cool, like with um, FT3 syndrome, which is um, to do with your thyroid. And so I did start to notice a few things in, in myself and my my personality. And, and I was trying to learn French actually down there. And, um, and when I came back, um, to Europe and I've started you know I'm now working in French and um, it was much easier for me to learn it here sort of back in normal life than it was in Antarctica and I think that was also a result of the fatigue so I definitely think that I noticed things in myself um, and also on a physical level as well I lost a lot of weight when I was down there and I'm, I'm someone that's pretty stable with weight and, um, and I did lose a lot of weight because I find it really hard to eat during the the long polar night especially because it felt like you're trying to eat like a three course dinner at like four in the morning or something it just kind of made, it, made you lose your appetite and we didn't have any fresh fruit and vegetables as well so so I guess on both the physical and the psychological level I was definitely you know exhausted I guess would be the best way to describe it um, and also coming back um sort of back into reality i guess um it was at that point as well that i noticed a bit more some changes in myself and so much that um one of my um, best friends came down to christchurch to meet me off the boat and we had like a three-week kind of holiday at the end of it and you know and i felt really like a lot more nervous than i would be normally just like checking into hotels and things i'd let her like go first and she actually went on a tinder date and left me for the day and i felt really nervous i was like going on the bus and I was like you know and it's crazy because you know before that I was you know in London and, and doing my thing and and so it was quite interesting to feel those changes but I don't think it was for me personally like changes which persisted it was just a, a few weeks where you felt just a bit overwhelmed and I think that also reflects the kind of simplicity as well of life down there because you know we had a chef um you don't go shopping like you you don't have all the choice that you have um, here in normal life, you know, you don't have 20 washing powders to choose from every time you want washing powder or, you know, 80 mangoes or like, you know, it's, well, maybe not 80, but like, you know, it's kind of trying to work out what you want to do in the evenings and, and actually taking all of that away gave you a lot more time and space just to kind of reflect and, and have a bit of time you know, it was refreshing really. Um, and I guess coming back to all that choice and coming back to having to buy things again, you know, I was just used to going in the cupboard and having to actually go shopping again was weird. And and also a world with money was strange as well because it's a, it's a really interesting sort of social experiment as well to take away money from um, groups and societies of people. And I think, it's, I think that's quite nice as well to see. One of the things that I wanted to ask you about because you're you weren't a typical person there right you're the doctor you're actually you're there part of your job is to watch people changing and, and medically psychologically i mean just as, as, as an example i had a student um oh almost 20 years ago a guy called nick tothill who was a student of mine and he um had just wintered over at south pole um so he had been working on one of the astronomy experiments there <clears throat> and i knew him from beforehand and then he spent a year there and he came out when he came out he was almost a completely different character. He had grown this enormous sort of outgoing extrovert sort of push. He was louder and bigger and brasher. And I got the impression that that was because something he kind of had to develop at the South Pole in order to maybe insulate himself or because you're surrounded by a bunch of other people and you can't get away from them. You can't sort of say, I don't like you or I do like you. You're there, you're, you're stuck. So you, your whole personality changes. And did you experience that? Did you see some people kind of go into a, into a, a hole and some people get even bigger and more extrovert? As, as an observer, because you're the doc, that was you, you were there to measure that, right? And I know you, you, always tell, you always tell me that people, some people are actually really kind of annoyed that you kept going and prodding them all the time. It's just leave me alone. Let me get on with what I'm doing. <laughs> Yeah, definitely even like in their rooms, it's like, hey, can you, can you do my science today? Um, what's difficult is because I didn't know 
all of the crew before Antarctica. I mean, when you go to all the training in the beginning, it's, it's a lot like, you know, Freshers' Week. Everyone's so nice and so friendly, and you're just like, wow, like we're gonna be the best crew ever. We're not gonna have any problems. These people are lovely. Um, and, you know, I can't possibly imagine it ever having any issues with anybody. And then I think as time goes on, people get tired and you start to really see people's true personalities. Um, coming out um, and so it, it is it's difficult to say whether or not um, people necessarily change but what was interesting to see and I think people struggled a lot more if um, you sort of had a life um, you left for Antarctica and then you tried to go back to that same life like the same job the same car the same fiance or wife and house and just try and go back to normal I think it was a lot more easy for people if like in my case for example I just finished my F1 F2 sort of junior doctor years and so the life that I had in London at that point was never going to be there when I got back it was like you know it's like finishing uni everyone so all the junior doctors go off in their separate ways and it's sort of the next chapter for me and I think that I would have found it quite difficult if I tried to like step back into that identical life that I had had before that. And I think that's that's where you can see, I think more the way that it's changed you as an individual, I think, and the people that had that um, definitely, I think struggled a bit more or definitely noticed, I think as well, a lot more sort of personal changes in themselves. Um, but also what you've got to remember is that some people actually find overwintering a lot more easy than maybe normal life as well. And that's also what you see is, um, especially for people that do lots of summers lots of people go down there year after year and then and you sort of lose that connection with sort of a normal life I suppose and and all your friends become Antarctic friends and and actually that becomes sort of more your life being being down there as well and and some people really like the structure and typically quite a lot of people from sort of military or submariners um people used to that kind of structure who thrive on that kind of structure often come and do sort of Antarctic over winters as well because they 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 like that lifestyle and they actually struggle a lot more sort of going back um back home at the end of it and we certainly saw that with some of our crew members as well and i um I'm, I'm conscious we we it's brilliant we've been running half an hour already and we want to bring some questions in from the outside in a moment alex has got that prepared <clears throat> but i there's a question i I can't remember if we've discussed this publicly. We've discussed it privately before. The chocolate story is that one that you can is that one you can relate in a way with it, you know without it making sound too bad. Because I found that just a fascinating insight into you know how, again how people cope and how people vary. And you have to accept that you, you know you're not going to be the same in your day to day relationships with people in mm. a situation which is very constrained from the outside. And you have to kind of prepare yourself for that. And I think a lot of a lot of us have been struggling. I mean, I'm here with my, I've got my wife and my two adult kids and, and that, that's been okay. But there've been a couple of moments where you've sort of said, right, enough, you, you need to do this and I need to do that. So the chocolate story for me was kind of an interesting insight if it's one you can relate. If you can't, then we'll just call it the chocolate story. Yeah, yeah, it's cool, the chocolate story. I love the chocolate stories. <laughs> So basically, um, the story that Mark's referring to is um, sort of about halfway through the winter, um, I, no I noticed that one of our crew members had been like um, hiding some some chocolate um, and other food things um, in the roof. Um, and this, this came, you know, our crew were all really upset about this. It was like, so basically all of the food is in a big food store. It's open to everybody, um, but it's generally the chef that goes in and like takes it out for, for dinner. But you know, if you wanted to go and get some chocolate, you're very welcome to go and do that. And although we would never run out of food in Antarctica because there's a huge amount, um, there are sort of, you know, the treats, like sort of your lint chocolate and your, your tonic water and all the, the nice things. Um, and this crew member, she, he, they, <laughs> <laughs> they had um put it put all the nice things in the roof and it wasn't because they were just keeping it for themselves but they were sort of gradually rationing it out so they would like put a few bars of chocolate out every every few days so that people didn't notice that they had like taken it but to to maintain that level of control and I think that's what a lot of people really struggle with then that is you lose any control over anything over your food over what you wear like you know it's kind of like people call it a white prison as well because you feel a little bit like an inmate and and it was really interesting to see psychologically that that individual um um, felt that they had to sort of maintain that control over over that food and but, and but it was it con 
as I remember us discussing before, it was it was almost as if this crew member didn't quite trust everybody else to have self control enough not to eat all the chocolate, and, and it was kind of them exerting a degree of control over everybody else, not not in an evil way, but sort of saying, let's this is my way of helping us all in in an odd way, right? Yeah, definitely, definitely. And that, I mean, that was reflect. You know, it wasn't like they'd just taken a little stash for themselves that they were um, eating every few weeks. They, you know, they're very much like sort of sharing it out amongst the crew so that we would all be able to have lint chocolate until the end. So, and it was interesting to see because it wasn't at all their job role. You know, so the chef had some degree of control over that, but they had sort of taken it on themselves to do that and gone to a lot of effort. You know, getting into the roof is no small feat. You know, up a ladder to to try and do it. So, yeah, I, I find that really interesting, sort of human psychology. Um, just to get that little feeling of control back. Cool. Beth, um, uh, uh, actually, I've got to say uh, and agree with Mark here. Uh, 30 minutes have absolutely flown here. Uh, and delighted to say we actually have a few people watching as well. And so um, we're going to uh, flip to a few questions from the audience who um, delightfully have popped in to uh, check out Uplink. Uh, it's very first outing here. Um, the first question comes from Dawn. Um, she says, um, you mentioned the sun being a constant, but did the fact that you could see the stars and constellations help ground you over winter? Yeah, totally. Um, and in many ways, even though you could consider the long polar night um, one of the hardest times, um, for me, in many ways, it was the most exciting. You know, it felt like a real challenge to get through that. It was something different. And the stars were really very beautiful. You know, I, I've always enjoyed being outside and, you know, sort of looking up and, and seeing the stars. I, I wouldn't say that I was a stargazer before I went down, but I certainly developed a new appreciation um, for, for all of the stars and and being able to see the Milky Way in that in that way, and and in a, in a funny way, you know, when you had a full moon, it, it would feel almost like daylight out there because it, it would be so bright with all the stars. And and we were really fortunate as well because we actually had an astronomer on base as well, and um, with a big telescope, and he was really kind and was able to sort of explain to us all of the interesting star formations and also you know when we could see planets at particular times, and also as well for the uh, southern lights, the aurora as well. So um, he. Was able to sort of predict when it would be more or less likely to, to have the southern lights because when it's minus 80 outside and you can't really see them out the window you know you had to be a little bit opportunistic um for when you sort of went outside to go and go and take a look so we are really lucky for that and for me that's you know lots of people well not lots but quite a lot of people get to go to antarctica um but to get to go for the winter and see that um is, is much fewer people so i feel really privileged to have had the chance to to see that really yeah one of the one of the things which is interesting about Antarctica, you know, you, you got to see it with a naked eye and with cameras, but there has been a lot of discussion over many years about putting serious research telescopes, and there are a bunch at the South Pole, um, mm. and there are there, there've been studies on putting them at um, Concordia Dome C, and yeah. I was involved in some of those studies with French in Italy uh, 15 years ago or so, um, and there are telescopes being built by the Chinese at Dome A, which is even higher up, around 4,000 meters. And people sort of wonder, you know, everybody has this image about Antarctica being this, you know, they have kind of Scott of the Antarctic type and Amundsen blowing winds and everybody kind of getting lost in, 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 in blizzards. But people don't appreciate that in the, on the domes in the center, the wind is very low because the wind is created by this cold air falling down onto the surface, catabatic winds. And as it rolls down towards the edge of the continent, then it gets really, really windy. The cold air just picks up speed as it goes down. But in the, in the domes it's incredibly dry right as you said at the beginning there's very little snow at all even though over yeah, millions of all. years it's built up to be very thick ice um, it's very dry uh, which is fantastic for infrared astronomy and there's very little winds so there's very little turbulence in the atmosphere as well um, so it is an amazing place for doing astronomy albeit extremely difficult for obvious reasons right halfway to space people talk about it being <laughs> no, I mean, I, I definitely experienced that as well. I think we had maybe two bad, two days of bad weather, I would say, my, my whole overwinter at Concordia. And it's really stable climate, you know, it was pretty much minus 80 the whole time. It wasn't like it went up and down. 
so you knew really what to expect when you're in outside and and as you say it is really dry and it's like it's weird um you know you pick up the snow and you expect to be able to make a snowball or like a snowman but you can't it's like picking up sugar it's just like that cold and dry and like when you're walking around the base because you've got you get all this like static electricity and I broke a hard drive within like five minutes of being there because I like electrocuted it and my hair as well because my hair's quite curly and it just went like super like straight and like up all over the place and yeah it was it was funny and like at night time you'd like move your blankets they gave us like these fleecy ones and you get all these electric um charges going off as well so we definitely noticed how dry it was and yeah, yeah. <laughs> and no That's smells true. as well because of that it's kind of weird it's like yeah yeah very good. Uh, we have another question uh, from Helen, um, who asks, I, I think, a, a question that I think a lot of us might be able to relate to at the moment. Um, how do you settle arguments in the household during isolation? Did you guys have a method for dealing with that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, it was quite interesting, like, in terms of, again, in terms of um, our dynamics and, like, human psychology. There weren't that many, like, big arguments between people people would be a lot more subtle in the way that they approach people that they didn't like um so for example we had one crew member that was hiding different um bits of people's kit around the base if they didn't like you <laughs> because like nobody wanted to be seen as the bad guy because it's like that like herd man mentality so if you were seen to be like causing arguments and being really argumentative and not a very nice crew member then everyone would sort of not like you so instead, <laughs> instead of doing that it, there was a lot of like psychological mind games in our crew which would be things like this you know hide, hiding things from other crew members um, but having said that, of course, there were conflicts and the disagreements. Um, and I, I think that the key thing is communication. And and um, and before we went down to Antarctica during the human behavior performance training at the Astronaut Center that we had, um, we had a bit of time to like learn about how we reacted and how our crewmates reacted to different situations. And so, for example, um, if I get really stressed and upset, I actually go really quiet. I find it really hard to speak to anybody um, when I'm really Really, truly angry um, whereas other sort of friends might have got really sort of loud and a bit more aggressive and a bit more um, adrenaline going and, and having an awareness of how people might be reacting can actually help you pick up on how they might be feeling perhaps even before they know themselves and it can help you put in some strategies um, in place to help support them as well if they're not having a good day and I think that's really important um, so sort of communicating if something annoys you tell someone because normally they don't try to do it on purpose um, and something can be done about it and try and talk about it sort of earlier and in a nice way before it becomes an issue and I, I think so communication would be the key. Very good um, uh, uh, we have a, a good question I guess from uh, from Harriet and uh, we touched on it just a little bit before but what are your top tips um, for uh, uh, people who I guess are finding this whole period of isolation uh, a lot to adjust to. Um, what, what, what are the, your best takeaways from your experience of Antarctica? Um, I think it's really important to keep a routine. Um, that helps with like your sleep wake cycle, um, sort of having lunch and dinner times with whoever it is you're isolating with, or if you're isolating alone, to try and do that with friends as well, sort of over Skype and stuff. Um, and try and control what you can. <laughs> so again, you know, like the food, the chocolate story, like Mark was talking about, you know, you do feel sort of a loss of control in these situations. And that one way that I dealt with that, you know, um, you know, if you're normally somebody that gets up in the morning and straightens their hair and puts on makeup and, and stuff like that, then do that. That when you're in isolation as well you know you don't sort of sit in your pajama bottoms all day and like you know sort of you know grow a massive beard if you're a guy because you you don't feel sort of yourself and I think it's important to try and make what you can normal in these sort of not normal situations and then you can deal with the less normal things um, which are happening whereas if everything becomes completely different then it all gets completely overwhelming so so when you can keep something normal try and keep it normal as much as you can and then and then the things that you can't control don't don't sort of amount out of control so I think um doing that's really important I think goal setting is really important as well as I said before you know try and have those goals sort of manageable goals but have something to work towards because as well you know we're not sure how long we're going to be in isolation currently in this particular period in Antarctica we found that the third or we find generally from research that the third quarter quarter of the mission is the most challenging and that's really just reflects the fact that at the beginning you know you're really stoked you're excited to be down there um you suddenly got a bit of time I'm not saying that we're all stoked to obviously be in this isolation situation but obviously you know it does give us a bit of an opportunity to to do some things that maybe we'd wanted to do and everyone sort of starts off quite motivated but it's trying to maintain that motivation um and 
and you know it's a bit like new year's you know we will set these like new year's resolutions and start doing it and then suddenly you know sort of a couple of weeks in you, you, the last thing you want to do is go into yoga so try and have some sustainable goals and i think that can really help um especially when things start to become a bit more challenging a, a bit further on as well and also try to be positive you know there, there's a lot of although it's not a situation that we choose there are some benefits that we can have from isolating ourselves in terms of as I mentioned before, just having a bit of time to step back from our normal lives to, to get a bit of a new perspective and to think about really what it is that we want to do in the future and maybe use this time as well to help prepare us for that, you know, if it's like online learning or, or something, um, try and sort of make the best of the situation if, if you can. Very good, very good. Uh, thank you for that. Um, we just have another quick, one. Just a, uh, just a quick one well, there, Alex, to jump in. <clears throat> I guess one of the things which is different here is, I mean, in Antarctica, you have the opportunity to make contact to the outside world. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it's not as you know as good as we have here, right? Because you don't have the same satellite bandwidth and so on from South Pole as you can have uh, elsewhere in the world. Of course, there's no terrestrial lines running, no cables. But mm -hmm. um, but the thing I was thinking about is, uh, uh, you know, because we have this externality here, we have the fact that the news is constantly banging on about this thing, which is which is a threat to our lives. And I found myself cutting that off at some level, just, yes, kind of being aware of it, but there's, there's only so much I can learn at this point by just constantly watching the television. So yeah. I just wonder whether it's, in a more general sense, from the medical perspective, whether it makes sense to kind of really isolate, 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 cut yourself off and cut off the things which might upset you and focus on the positive. Yeah. Um, at the same time, you know, not losing complete contact with the world, right? So, uh, yeah, it's, it's it's obviously not polar winter there at the moment, right? <laughs> yeah, sorry, <laughs> it's funny. Um, no, I think you're totally right. And it was, um, again, it was something that, that we looked at as well in terms of getting the right level of communication, because it's important to sort of be present in what it is you're experiencing, whether you're isolating with a friend or something whatever it is you're doing now and not constantly be online because actually that can you know you can go for a whole day sort of <laughs> isolating with somebody and not actually see them if you don't make time to actually sort of have a cup of tea with somebody and actually chat to them when you're <laughs> when you're having lunch and it's really important to sort of live what it is that, that where you are um but also it can be useful to have that sort of opportunity as well to um to have a, an external influence whether you know I remember um, when we were in Antarctica this one time um, we were running out of paper napkins which you know across my mind would be a huge issue when I was over in Antarctica but it actually upset a lot of our, our crew members I remember having like a, a meeting and everyone you know discussing what we we're going to do and some people came, you know saying that napkins were a sign of civilization and if we like lose this so you know we've lost <laughs> everything and then somebody fortunately coming up with the idea of making like um material napkins <laughs> so we could wash them so that we didn't have an issue anymore but but the point is um while i was down there that felt like a really big deal you know but actually i like skyped one of um, my best friends at home and i explained what i'd be doing with my afternoon and she was like are you serious like is that actually a thing and i was like and it's just really good to like have somebody to talk to you and i was like you know what you know it's not the end of the world it's okay and i i think you know whenever we're isolating be it at home and in this situation you know small things can blow completely out of proportion and so i think it is useful to if we're possible have that external voice just to say like this happened then people will be like really bad like that's really not a big problem um so i think it can be useful but i think as you say it's not useful to be connected all the time too much just completely connected to your computer and not living um living for the moment as well and not communicating yeah. with who, who it is you're you're with or even just taking that time for yourself as well and and also you know with social media and computers it you know it is easy to spend all day and and to maybe reading sources which aren't useful as well and i think controlling that information is useful too because up in space as well people are becoming a lot more connected now and that's also can cause some trouble because um when we were in antarctica we had the charlie hebdo attacks as well um and there wasn't any control of that information coming into the station and a lot of people were really anxious because a lot of them came from Paris or were French 
Um, and so actually maybe a few years before when you don't have internet in Antarctica and you can have a station leader that's able to sort of announce what's happened with more information, um, it's a lot less, it drives a lot less anxiety than getting bits of information. And, and I think that's, it's an important to keep, keep the balance. I think it can be handy, but I think don't rely on it too much. As well. Excellent. We, uh, we actually uh, have a, a pretty interesting uh, question and a comment uh, from Matt Taylor. Uh, hey, Matt. Um, uh, who, who he makes the point, but I think um, also sparks real curiosity as well, is obviously, you know, the big difference uh, between people in orbit and then even, you know, down here on Earth in Antarctica, um, is that going outside for them isn't as much of an option perhaps as it is in Antarctica. So of course, I mean, there is a difference there, but uh, uh, the curiosity is, could you actually go outside in Antarctica? I mean, what 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 was the status? I mean, I don't imagine it's as easy as me walking or uh, down to the park or something like that. Am I, you know, one a day allotted exercise slots? Certainly. I mean, what was it like for you? Did did opening the front door uh, even present itself as an option to you? Yeah, so I mean, you could go out. Um, it was really cold. Um, so I mean, I would put on like so many layers. It took me about like ten minutes to get all layered up, and I would have like nothing showing. So I had like this. I even had like um like a balaclava that was just made out of down. So it's like putting a down jacket over my face, and then putting goggles on top over that. So you wore goggles even during the night, um, which were like clear, so that you didn't have any. Um, skin touching and so although you could go outside um, because you were wearing all this stuff and it was super heavy and on top of that you are at altitude as well so you don't have the same levels of oxygen you felt like really claustrophobic so I kind of found like coming back in from outside to inside where I could take it all off and like take a sort of breath of air like that kind of felt like the inverse of you know when you go outside and you sort of feel that you can breathe like the fresh air outside so so you could go outside but you didn't get that same feeling that you do when you go outside here that you can sort of that you feel a bit is there free, if that makes sense. I, I can't remember the I'm trying to struggle to remember what it's called is it called the 500 club at south pole <laughs> is, is there the equivalent of that uh, you should probably explain what it is if it exists <laughs> Yeah. um at concordia because it's france and italy i'm sure i'm sure there's a there must be a sauna right i told you this story <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, no leading questions beth go on <laughs> so, um what mark is referring to is the fact that um you can go in so we actually have a sauna um but it's not it's not something that runs all yet we had it like three or four times and it's like a little shed outside and you you put it on super super hot um and then you go from super high temperature and then you yeah, <laughs> I wore pants and boots, um, crucially boots, and then you have to run around. Um, first, you have to run around one of the towers of the station and then back um, to sort of. <laughs> so your temperature drop, you know, going from like plus 90 to minus 80, which in Fahrenheit works out. Like yeah, minus. maybe it's 300 degrees Fahrenheit or something. Yeah, maybe not yeah. 500. That's a little bit extreme. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's crazy. And uh, it's such a strange feeling because you like run outside it and it, you don't actually get cold straight away. It's a weird feeling. It's like you've got so much adrenaline, just like I'm doing this and running. And then you're like running and then you just like feel your body. It just like gets colder and you're just like going for it and you just get really, really slow and like actually. So, so, so just to be clear again, you're in the sauna. You <laughs> People don't wear much in the sauna. You put boots and pants on and that's it. And you run around. Excellent. Minus the... 80, yeah. <laughs> what lots of people do it like it's like a midwinter thing so midwinter in Antarctica is like the um like Christmas it's kind of right in the middle and we have lots of celebrations and all the different stations send each other cards and what well, sort of electronic cards we can't we don't have paste of course um and we all have a, a few days of, of party and things so um, and that's that's classically and that was when I did that <laughs> in Antarctica so, yeah. <laughs> it was memorable yeah, yeah. <laughs> I bet <laughs> <laughs> Including the, uh, the bits that you've bit the bits that fell off and you found them on the snow afterwards, memorable. <laughs> <laughs> And then you're like, oh my god, like it was so cool. Obviously, like, there's lots of people who are there to like scoop you up if, if needs be. Because at South Pole, I think they run from the Scott Amundsen base around the actual South Pole. And if I recall, I mean, they're, they're moving apart over time, right? Because the ice actually moves in Antarctica, it's slowly moving downhill as well. And hmm. the, the position of Antarctica, the Amundsen Scott base was moving relative to the South Pole yeah. physical location. So it was becoming further every year or something like that. But so, yeah. Yeah. 
Very good. Uh, uh, thank you very much for that. We have another question um, from uh, Amanda on behalf of Annabelle. Um, she wanted to ask, uh, so how did you keep in, your, uh, in touch with your family while you were overwintering? Um, so it depended. Um, we actually had sort of two months where the internet didn't work very well at all. And when I say that we have internet on the station, um, we have like a certain amount of internet. And um, most of the time, it's a little bit like, you know, sort of old dial up internet. So you go onto a page and then you put it in and then you sort of have to wait like five minutes for it to like load up. So you could check like your Gmail or you could maybe post a Twitter picture, but it wasn't like the kind of internet you can just like surf and we certainly couldn't download anything. Um, but having said that, we did have um, WhatsApp Messenger on our phone, so I couldn't call anybody, but I could do like, because of Wi-Fi, we could do WhatsApp Messenger. Um, and I could occasionally Skype. So the thing was, you could, um, when they weren't sending any scientific data, they could like um, cut off all the computers so that you could have one computer that had a good line. So occasionally I'd be able to, to Skype my family. Um, but other things that we did and like strategies that we put in place was, um, so um, I took down loads of presents with me, ready for like Christmas and ready for birthdays and things off my family. Um, so that was another nice thing to sort of feel connected to everybody. Um, and, you know, I could call them on, on the phone occasionally as well. So you weren't super connected, but, but you could certainly stay in touch. Is the, I'm just trying to remember the technology again for the, the internet there. I mean, there's Iridium phones, of course, not anymore, because most of well, actually, there's the new Iridium constellation, they go polar, so you can contact, but is it, am I right in remembering that it's actually geostate, yeah, I know, yeah, all right, don't, don't ask me, Mark, she said, <laughs> I think there are geostationary satellites, which are normally, of course, above the equator, but they've, they've been put out of their geostationary orbit so they can be actually seen from the poles and I think those are used also for internet connections so there is a bit of satellite but it's not very much right compared to um, where there's a landline here or satellites above us where we get our tv from yeah no no and I, I, to watch movies and like we didn't have tv but we had like um, a hard disk drive so we could like that well not download but you know just watch movies and things like that which actually broke like three weeks before the end of the overwinter so we were super lucky <laughs> Um, that that wasn't right at the beginning of the winter because I think that would have been a different story and I um, I sent a message to one of the the pilots um, called Jim who had actually like dropped a, he was like the last plane um, leaving us for the winter and he's a really cool guy he's like worked in Antarctica I think for like 15 years and like everyone knows him he's like super famous in Antarctica and then he does Antarctica in the winter and then he goes and does like bush fire fighting in the in the summer and then and so he came down and like um I was like hey Jim can you like bring us a hard drive because like we have nothing <laughs> and I was still in Antarctica after the winter for quite a few months um and he bought me like six series of ice pilots I was like oh <laughs> I was like, thanks, dude. Like, that's exactly what I want to watch. That's what he watches, right, every day. <laughs> and he was in episode six, I think. So I was like, oh, cool. Like, yeah. Very good. Um, uh, I think we've got a really uh, interesting question because I think it's one we can also all relate with as well. Because I think something that I've definitely found, and many have as well, is not that they're completely cut off from everyone, um, but they're almost in constant comms because pretty much their entire social life goes toward online, you know, and online interactions, all that kind of stuff. So, so Wizard mm -hmm. Dragon says, although it's possible, um, would you recommend perhaps people taking a little break um, from contact, actually just cutting themselves off and just, I guess, allowing themselves to absorb the experience? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I mean, we didn't have the same experience, but obviously I'm in isolation um, now as well, like, like everybody because of um, COVID. And I, I think it is really healthy to take a bit of time just to just to interact with the, the people that you're isolating with, or to, as you say, you know, sort of have a bit of time for yourself, because I think, I think otherwise it can get quite frustrating, you know, if you try and sort of live the same lives that you normally live but online, um, you don't really sort of gain so much from that, whereas maybe sort of taking the opportunity to sort of step back and and um, and try something a bit different for a little while as well can can be useful for people. I mean, it's not really something that I have that much experience from with Antarctica. Although having said that, we did have um, these two months where we had less connectivity than we did for the rest of the mission. That was just a problem with the satellite. Um, and during that two months, we only had satellite 
phone calls which are really expensive and quite short and so we did have that period and and sometimes I think it was better for um, the crew and sort of the Antarctic experience in in some respects to really feel like you were living that experience and not trying to be too connected to people um, at home and and also I find in our crew actually some people were a little bit hostile <laughs> towards people that were too much trying to um, be in touch with their friends at home and I, I was really interested by that because um, they felt like them trying to be too much in touch with their friends was meant that they didn't respect the crew as being you know good enough for them or you know enough for them or that they didn't want to have this experience with, with the crew so I think it was really important um, for us as a crew to make sure that we got that balance right and I think it's also the same for us here because you know I don't I think being online all the time, as Mark said, just watching the news constantly can raise a lot of anxiety, but also it can be quite frustrating as well to try and just keep all these online friendships and not not really sort of experience real life as it were. You, you remind me, you had, um, in addition to flying in and out of Concordia, you had this extra super cool experience right at the end, right, where you did the traverse. Um, Explain to people what that is, because, you know, that, I, I still have this mental picture of you driving these enormous tractors. I mean, Beth, Beth is not the biggest person in the world, right? I mean, you can, you can look, if, I'm not saying you're not strong and everything else, but these are these vehicles you were driving, right? Explain to everybody what the Traverse was at the end. I think it was at the end, right? Yeah, it was at the end. So I'd actually seen it coming um, sort of during the summer before. And I was like, wow, I want some of that. It was like these huge, big, um, like huge caterpillar tractors. I mean, they're, they're literally like, I'm smaller than the wheels of these things. They're huge. Um, but they, and basically you drive in like two tractor pairs, so two big tractors with a big piece of rope between it and then um, loads of shipping containers on skis behind each tractor pair. Um, and we had eight tractor, well, eight tractors, so four tractor pairs with like ski, um, like snow plies in between making like a little road. And we drove from the coast of Concordia uh, of Antarctica to Concordia, which is about 1,200 kilometers um, on the ice, which for me was just the coolest experience. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, and it lasted about two weeks. So I basically, I flew um, from Concordia to the coast in like a small twin otter plane, which are like the sort of, you know, like the classic um, polar planes that you see. And then I had two weeks at the coast where I got to see all the penguins finally, because we don't actually have any penguins at Antarctica, which was a huge disappointment for me. When at I Concordia, you mean? You were expecting yeah. there to be penguins and sea lions around at four, three and a half thousand meters altitude. Well, right. okay. <laughs> And um, and so I had a bit of a chance to do that, and then um, and then we set off on this um, amazing journey, and it, and it, yeah, it was amazing because it just made me realise firstly how remote Concordia is as a place because you just drive for days and days and days and days and you see nothing, you know. And if you walk off the side of this little track, then you're probably walking on a part of Antarctica that's never been trodden on, which I thought was um, very cool. But it was also um, for me, it was a really valuable um, bit of time as well to kind of reflect on everything that had happened during the overwinter in Concordia and, and all of that and sort of like assimilate it, I guess, into to my head, just to, you know, work out what had all happened because it was um, such a, an amazing experience and, um, and to think about what it is I wanted to do when I got back and, and also about what I've been doing before. And it was, it was a really special time to just have that bit of time out and and for that, I, I couldn't contact anybody for the, the whole time. And and I think it was, and also in my tractor cab, like I was just, you know, I was like a tractor just driving. I mean, it wasn't um, particularly, <laughs> you know, it wasn't too many things to crash into, so it was fine. Um, bearing in mind, I hadn't driven even a car for like 14 months, because obviously you can't drive anything. So, um, so, so yeah, I think it was um, really great to have that time um, away from technology, away from everything, and just with a small little crew that you had lunch and dinner with and, and that small community. And, uh, and I think I really benefited from that personally. Um, also psychologically for me, for my return journey home, and I don't know, you know, often people often ask that question about, you know, sort of was it a massive shock coming back? And although I think I did find it a bit of a struggle, I think if I hadn't have had that time, I think I would have found it a lot more difficult. Um, and I think 
a lot of the people that do really struggle in Antarctica get taken out on like the first plane because they've had enough and then they get taken to like Heathrow Airport all of a sudden and they don't have that sort of transition period and I think that that's really useful um, for everyone and I think also when uh, hopefully <laughs> um, the isolation um, that we're experiencing ends as well I think it's important that we all take a bit of time you know to sort of get back into the the swing of things as well and not expect to just go back straight away to to what what we were perhaps doing before and I think I think that's long term I think that's a lot, a lot more beneficial for everyone you also just because you know there's also the whole science aspect about being in Antarctica but you did a, a particularly cool science experiment on that traverse um, which in, in a kind of you know metaphorical way is relevant, right? Looking looking for biology basically in the middle of nowhere, right? Yeah, yeah, it was um, it was an experiment that we were doing, which was um, I I'd, I'd been doing it all year at Concordia as well. Um, so we were looking, we were taking snow samples um, in. Um, three different zones so we're taking them right by the station which was like the kind of dirty dirty zone um, a little bit further out in places that people had like walked in but not very often um, and then in places which we considered were probably untouched or as clean as we we could expect and we were taking these samples to see if we could find any extremophile um, bacteria um, and then also I did the same experiment going from the coast of Antarctica where we know that of course you know there's penguins there's a lot of thing, things living there um, to Concordia to see that transition and also to take those samples in those areas as I mentioned before where that's probably pristine untouched um, Antarctica as well and because the um, conditions as well sort of the minus 80 degrees centigrade and then dryness in the atmosphere um, it's similar in some respects to Mars as well so it's hoped that if we find something, then it will help inform us about sort of life forms that we could find on these other planets too. And was there stuff, you know, out in the middle of absolutely nowhere? Do you know the results of those experiments? Um, we found some things, but we've not found, unfortunately, anything new, but it's an ongoing experiment. So with my, uh, we've not, not, but it's, it, we're still at it. So <laughs> fingers crossed. <laughs> cool. Uh, we have a quick question from the Nepal Astronomical Society, um, you know, who possibly have a comment about our timings as well for Uplink, which is certainly something to consider. Um, uh, they're curious about a, a situation uh, in Antarctica uh, regards to bathing. Did that change? And um, I think that's certainly uh, something I think a lot of people experiencing isolation for the first time might have noticed that uh, actually alters in terms of what their daily schedule is. Oh, what did what was, did you say? Uh, uh, what was the bathing situation down there? I mean, did bathing. You oh, like and, showering. Yes, indeed. Sh showering? Like what was yeah, it like? Yeah. Showering. <laughs> okay. Yeah, keep, keep, uh, keeping personal hygiene. I mean, I, I'm conscious Matt Taylor's still watching, who hasn't washed now for four <laughs> weeks. If I've got it right. So. <laughs> okay. No. Um. So it depends is where you were, but um, like I mean, you could. So actually, we're doing water recycling. Um, on the Concordia station, um, which again was an ESA led experiment. Um, and so we were recycling all of our grey water, um, which is all your sort of shower water and everything. Um, so we had to use um, like special shampoo in the shower. So you couldn't just use any um, products because it would ruin the water, grey water recycling. Um, so um, the only difference was um, to the water recycling that they do in space is that it doesn't actually extract urine from the shower. So we did have some nasty surprises about halfway through the winter where somebody decided to start peeing into the shower system. Um, and so we all had some disgusting showers for, for a few weeks. But by and large, the, the great water system was very effective and it was a really um, excited way to provide, um, you know, fresh, clean um, drinking water. And it's actually an experiment which... I really like because it's been used in a sort of Moroccan village um, since to provide um, clean drinking water for a community there as well. So it's a really exciting piece of technology that can be used at both sort of extra planetary um, situations, but also um, back here on Earth as well. So, so yeah, so most of the time we had sort of normal showers by those, those few weeks. Um, and then toilets were normal, but we did have one or two, um, especially during these some are called like in cine loos, I think they're called, and they basically <laughs> you to, like do your thing in like a little um packet, and then it just goes into <laughs> this thing um, where there's like a burning 
incinerator and it incinerates everything and you get a little um, thing of smoke that comes out when it goes in. So that was quite funny, but I tried to avoid you <laughs> using that. Um, but that's something also that we used on the Traverse. Um, but actually on the Traverse, the Traverse being the, um, the land sort of driving the cat tractors. Um, but you know, it's a bit like a caravanning holiday because you're, you're, you're taking all of the fuel for the overwinter for Antarctica. So you, you don't have to, you know, you have enough fuel to have like hot showers. And, you know, and we had like one of the shipping containers was a little bit like a little caravan unit and we would stop. And, and John Louis, who's this amazing chef, would had like basically like frozen us like, <laughs> like a gatto and like all this like amazing meals so i think being british like we always think you know the brits always love like our expeditions and like expedition meals and rations and like to you know you know to kind of uh, rough it i guess whereas the italians and the french definitely take a different approach so i i am um, yeah i can't say that i wrapped it on the traverse but <laughs> there's a famous story from concordia about um all the wine that was taken in one year so th th <laughs> there's wine and the wine was taken in it was taken in one of the one of the containers which was not um insulated so all the wine bottles froze and broke <laughs> and when they opened the container when they arrived at concordia there was just sort of shards of glass mixed with wine ice and of course they saved it all right they actually shoveled it all in a place and heated it up and strained the glass out because they were not going to not have a winter without without wine I, um, could imagine. I mean we had so much wine that like when we play like rugby in the summer they would use red wine to like make the like <laughs> <laughs> the kind of cool. like, so it wasn't something that we were sure of um but my sister actually she was like, really kindly because you have like your own container that you take out there and, and I mentioned that you um you send gifts from your family and so my sister sent me like this box of like Christmas things and I hadn't obviously asked her what was in it because it was for Christmas <laughs> but then when when my container arrived I was like oh it's cool like you know um and it's arrived right at the end of summer and I was like oh you know all my stuff and then I went off and had lunch and I came back and, and it was just disgusting. It was like soaking wet. And she had basically um, packed me loads of like little tonic waters with some gin. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a Christmas thing but all the cans because all the tonic was like freezes because all your personal things aren't insulated for this journey and then um and then obviously when it like um, melt um all of it melted because I put it inside then it all just melted all over all my um treats and things for the whole winter so I had like disgusting tonic <laughs> and everything for the whole winter period it <laughs> gone cold. Yeah. Very good. Um, uh, uh, well, we, yeah. <laughs> there it is. Wrong, wrong impression. Everyone was very mistaken. exactly. You just had to say that a little bit too, too, too hard, right? No, no, no. <laughs> Winter is yeah. <laughs> well, um, uh, well, I think uh, that's almost the time we have. Uh, just, just one more, and I think it's the crucial question, Beth, and I think it's totally brand appropriate to uh, to Space Rocks. Um, Luis Alvarez says, um, "What were you listening to while you were down there?" <laughs> um all sorts of things um i would love to say something like really you know cool <laughs> and edgy but i must say that the the songs which actually i remember the most were the ones which i was listening um to when i was um driving across the um plateau in the in the tractor and i was actually listening to avicii which <laughs> So, um, so for me, whenever I hear a beachy, that like totally reminds me of Antarctica and the experience I had down there. So, I mean, <laughs> I wish it was something a, a bit cooler, but unfortunately, it's that. <laughs> totally <laughs> fine. Yeah. Totally cool. Yeah, it's it's, it's you know. It, it, Having it in Antarctica makes it cool. Anywhere else, yeah, we could debate. But you know, driving a caterpillar tractor across the the, the vast expanses, you could be listening to anything and it'd be cool. <laughs> and also Queen, after you know Brian May, of course, like he always. Hey. <laughs> that reminds me of that experience too, because he's he's a total legend and uh, and all he's done for space sports as well. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, he was. All right. Well, Beth, um, uh, on behalf of everyone who um, tuned into this live stream. And everyone at Space Rocks, thanks so much for sharing your uh, incredible wisdom and experiences with us. And uh, it's been so great to break new ground for us with you as well. So thank you for your time. Very much appreciated. Thank you, no Beth. It's been, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Okay, you be well. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you thanks soon. Everyone. Okay, bye-bye, okay. everybody. Bye-bye. Hey, oh, we can do that. Yeah, we can do it. Yeah, it's too late. <laughs> yeah, very good. We'll see you. All right, bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.